Good morning. So a couple of weeks ago, Dean, Dean talked to us about, does it work? And he talked about, does it work personally? Does it work corporately? And, and does it work culturally? And, and I think it was a great sermon. And all of those things, I'd say, are true. But if it is true, if it does work personally, culturally, corporately, then why are so many people rejecting it? Why are so many people turning away from Christianity if it does work? And I think part of the answer is people are confused about what it is. So today, I'm going to look at three things. I'm going to look at what is it. And I'm going to begin by looking at the scripture, Jeremiah 12, and kind of apply it to this question of what is it. And then the second thing I'm going to look at, I'm going to call, is it Mother D? And I'm going to explore what Mother D is when we get to that. And again, I'm going to look at scripture first, and then look at how that applies to that question. And the last part I'd like to address is really who is good. So let's get down to it. What is it? Jeremiah, in verses 1 to 3 of Jeremiah 12, complains about essentially it. He, he talks about the wicked prospering. He talks about the faithless living at ease. And I think the New American Standard translates this nicely. It doesn't say the faithless. It says, all those who deal in treachery are at ease. It talks about these people growing and bearing fruit. And it talks about them always having God on their lips, but not in their hearts. Now, Scripture isn't quiet about this. Over and over again, we we hear this lament in Scripture. Why do people that we consider wicked, why do we see them succeeding? Why do we see their lives prospering? In, in Job, in Job 21, why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? They see their children established around them, their offspring before their eyes. Their homes are safe and free from fear. The rod of God is not on them. In Habakkuk 3, why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Sorry, there is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. I think the first thing is, it's nice that Scripture is honest. That when we talk about it working, when we talk about the justice of God, we're not, we're not ignoring the fact of, of what happens in the world. That often the people that we think are impure, evil, unjust, unjust, we see them succeeding. We see them looking happy. We see them with wealth. We see them with power. We see them with crowds of adoring fans. We see them, and then we look at our lives, and, and there's a question. How come, how come they're being blessed? How come they're succeeding? And Scripture is not silent on it. That God hears this, and God, God has an answer for it. And again, I think our question is, what is the it that God gives us? What is the it that works? 
if the it is material prosperity, if it's wealth, then I think we need to be honest that many things work to get wealth. And Christianity probably is, is not the most effective of them. If you want to become wealthy, if you want to become a rich man or a rich woman, following the Bible, that's not what it's teaching you. And those are not necessarily the blessings that God is going to give you. If it is following our own desires, if it is doing what we want and having freedom, our freedom to do as we wish, as our hearts desire, then I'd say run from the Bible because in the Bible you're going to have a God who is, is going to say to you that many of the things your heart desires are, are not righteous, are not good, and that we as human beings, every one of us, we need to change. If we want a life of ease, without trouble, without danger, without any worries, then, you know, you can, you can see that a little bit in Jeremiah where he talks about where people always have God in their lips, but not in their hearts. That they are rooted and they grow and bear fruit. If you're looking for a life without trouble, then in some senses the Bible does give you that. God does give you that. But the Bible doesn't give that to you by removing trials. In fact, the Bible says the opposite. It says everyone who desires to live a godly life will essentially be tested, will go through problems. And that these are actually proof that God loves us because when God gives us trials and challenges, he's correcting us and treating us as sons. If it's relationship, relationship with God, salvation and righteousness, not because of what we can do, but because of what God has done, in Christ. If that's what you're looking for, then it, it is only found in Scripture. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If the it that you are looking for in your life is a relationship with a living and real God, then it is found in Christianity. In Psalm 37, 1, it says, Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither away. Like green plants, they will soon die away. But God has an answer to the evil in the world around us. God knows it's there. The it that Scripture offers us is a relationship with God and a knowledge that what we're going through, we can have peace about, because God's in control. And that there is going to be a time when there is going to be righteous judgment, when there will be judgment, fair judgment, by one who knows the heart and who knows all things. Ravi Zacharias, as many of you know, is, is a Christian apologist. He, he grew up um, an atheist and became a Christian. Actually, I'm not sure if he was an atheist or whether he belonged to another belief system. But Ravi became a Christian, and he passed away on, on May 19th of this year. And one of, one of the things Ravi said, I think, is a very true statement. What he said was that Jesus Christ didn't come into the world to make bad people good. He came into the world to make dead people alive. So, people chase after a whole lot of things. Today, it's really common to hear things worded around happiness. 
And people often think their happiness is connected to money, prosperity, power, prestige, respect. But I think a lot of people don't even know where their happiness is going to come from. They just want to be happy. They just don't know how. I think when we talk about, does it work? Does a relationship with Jesus Christ work? What we're really saying is that happiness, prosperity, wealth, power, sexual gratification, all of these things are not going to bring you the peace that you desire. That ultimately the peace you desire, it's what Jesus refers to as a peace with it that surpasses understanding. That the peace you desire is, is not found in those things, but that it, it is found in a person, in a relationship with a person, with Jesus Christ. And that when we have that, the peace that you desire will come. Not necessarily because your troubles go away, but because you know that there is someone who has purpose in everything you go through. That there is a God, a judgment, a fair and fair and all-knowing, loving, just God who will bring all things to completion. Jesus Christ didn't come into the world to make bad people good. He came into the world to make dead people alive, to bring us to glorious life, to bring us to a full life, a life lived to the max, a life full of adventure, a full of meaningfully of meaningful struggle a struggle for purposes that matter i think as as we speak about injustice in jeremiah i think at this time, we really have to say something about the George Floyd situation in Minneapolis. And I feel, I feel kind of like Jeremiah here, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that if I say something, I'm going to offend somebody. And if I don't say something, I'm going to offend someone else. And so, God, may, may you guide me in my words, and, and may, may I please you. So I, I think we're Pretty much all aware that something terrible, tragic, and, and unjust happened in Minneapolis this week. And I hope if we're honest with ourselves, we recognize that this is not a U.S. problem or, or even simply a black-white problem. I think if we're honest, this comes down to a human problem that we are a sinful people that we, our best institutions fail, and, and that none of us are good. I've, I've faced plenty of racism growing up here in Canada. <clears throat> um, I've had people spit on me. I've been called a variety of names, told to go back to my country, and a variety of other things that I'd probably not care to recount. I think Canada, you know, one of the funny things about racism here is is that it's often done after a polite smile. You know, that to your face, people smile. And then afterward, or just out of earshot, they think, then come the, the comments and things. I'll, I'll be honest. I, I much prefer an honest racist who tells me to my face, I don't like you. For some of us, the, the hate, the injustice we feel is not race-based. For, for some, it's economic. It's because of how much or how little we have. 
or, or it's the clothes we wear, or it's relational. It's about who, who our father was, or who our mother is, or who we're dating, or who we're not dating. I, I think human beings, we, we are experts at being unjust. And yet we like to pretend that we are just, but that everyone else, they're the problem. We probably complain about injustice to us. And then the next minute we go out and we treat others unjustly. Jeremiah saw that injustice and he was terribly troubled by it. Isaiah saw it and cried out to God about it. David saw it. And I think most importantly, God sees it. God is not blind. God knows. In, in this passage in Jeremiah, even as Jeremiah tells this to God, it's not something that is new to God. So the, the Minneapolis situation with George Floyd actually happened um, a short walk away from my in-law's house. So I, I could walk to that intersection where George Floyd was killed. It would take me about five minutes. Um, so it's, it's not far from, from my headspace, if you want to put it that way. I'd just like to give some, some guidance on how perhaps we can deal with this tragic situation and this tragedy in general. And I think the first thing I'd like to offer is that we should look inside our own hearts, that this is where it should begin, that we need to look inside of ourselves, what we do, I do, I say, the way I get offended, the way I get angry, the way I get rude, hateful towards other people. I think we need to remove the plank from our own eye before we can go pointing at others. Although it's way, it's way more fun to point at others and, and we get to feel all good about ourselves because we feel like, you know, they're worse than I am and that somehow makes us better. I, I remember I was in a car. I was driving in Toronto with a friend and and somebody in front of us did something illegal. I think they just didn't signal or something. And and my friend who was driving suddenly came out with all these curses and was like, how in the world did that person get their license? What kind of idiot are they? You know, don't you know the law? And while, while he's still sitting there swearing about that driver, he pulls a totally illegal U-turn. And as he's pulling that illegal U-turn, he starts going off again about, ah, that law, that's a stupid law. You know, that law shouldn't be in existence. And I just sat there kind of going, wow, you, you just spent, you know, one minute you're criticizing someone else for breaking the law and, and talking about what a fool and... Those, those are the politest words I can say. And then the next second, he does it himself in a much greater way. But his is okay. And I think we all have that tendency. And we need to be honest with ourselves that we are not good. We are not just. That we, we are the problem. And that before we point at someone else, we should take some time and really look, look inside here. And it's probably going to be a long time. I think we all, we all love the people that love us. And, and we see good in those people that look like us, behave like us, the ones that are part of our tribe. God calls us to be better, though. God calls us to love our enemies. God calls us 
love our friends, definitely. But God also calls us to love the people who mistreat us, to love the people who hurt us, who hurt those we love. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and you're struggling with how to deal with how to reconcile what happened in Minneapolis, then can I suggest that if you are someone that sympathizes with the difficulty of law enforcement, that you take some time and you, you reflect and learn to love the George Floyds of this world. If, if you're somebody who empathizes and hurts for George Floyd and you see the injustice that was done to him, then again, take some time also and, and think and learn to love the police officers involved. When God calls us to love our enemies, he is calling us to do something that's against our natures that our human nature rebels against. We want to love our friends and hate our enemies. God says, that's, that's not my way. God says to love, to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's in Matthew 5, 44. God doesn't say pray against those that persecute you. He, he says, love your enemies and pray for them. And that requires love. And that requires our hearts to empathize and feel not just for those who are like us, but for those who are different than us. And the very people that might be calling us names and harming us, God calls us to love them. Because he loved us even when we were sinners and far from him. And finally, my... My last piece of suggestion from the Bible, and may it be true to what God teaches, is, is to trust in God, to wait upon his judgment. No judgment that we human beings put in will ever be perfect, because we're not perfect. We, if you look at your own family, how perfect are the judgments that you have made with your parents or with your children? How, how pure have the judgments been that you've made with your partner, with those that are closest to you? I don't know if you're like me. Your life is probably filled with people you've hurt, relationships which you have damaged, with people you love who you have sometimes unwittingly, sometimes without wanting to hurt. And I think as we look ahead to whatever happens with George Floyd, we need to realize, you know, it's not going to be perfect. And it's not something more to point at others about, but it's something to realize that God is the one that's perfect and good. And in the end, the system that's broken here is this system. It's our heart. It's me. And I need to wait and trust in God and in his judgment. In, in, Isaiah, in Isaiah 30, 18, it says, The Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. So, so I say to you, wait for the Lord. Wait for his justice. We sometimes think that human anger, human indignation, human governments, or, you know, the future, as in Star Trek, is, is going to bring it. It's going to bring justice. It's going to bring goodness. It's going to bring our happiness. And, and it 
is Jesus Christ. That the peace and justice we desire, the righteousness we hope for, that it, it's only in Christ. So I, I would say, come, Jesus, come. Come, return, and judge this world. And bring, bring righteousness. Bring true justice here, because we don't have any. Even even within churches, I think we have we've often become confused about what it is. We become confused about what it is that Christ is and does in our lives. So there's a there's a couple of researchers, uh, sociologists, called Christian Smith and Melinda Denton. And a little while ago, wow, about 15 years ago now, they, they wrote a book called Soul Searching, The Religious and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers. And, and they created a term that they called moralistic therapeutic deism, MTD. But I don't know about you, I find it hard to remember moralistic therapeutic deism and so I kind of think of it as Mother D, moralistic, therapeutic, Mother D, deism. And, and their conclusion studying American teenagers was that Mother D was the real God that many American teens worship. And, and as people have looked and thought about what they wrote, a lot of people think that for many of us, even here, we sometimes mix God up with Mother D. We mix God up with moralistic, therapeutic deism. And, and this is what Mother D is. Mother D is the belief that there is a God. And he exists. And he created and ordered everything, and that's it. He's kind of like a watchmaker. He made the watch, and now it just kind of runs, and he just kind of watches. Mother D wants people to be good, nice, fair. And, you know, this is the same as all the religions on earth. So... You know, Mother D fits perfectly in with a lot of modern secular thinking. In, in Mother D's religion, the goal of God, the goal of our life, it's about our happiness. The goal of my life is to feel good about myself and to be happy. And that's what Mother D wants. And Mother D... He's not involved in my life. Mother D, you know, she made everything and now I just get to, as long as I'm happy, as long as I'm nice, it's all good. And if I'm good, then I get to go to heaven. I know that when I look at what I believe, Every now and then, maybe more often than I want to think about, the God I worship is not the God of the Bible, but Mother D slips in there. Moralistic, therapeutic deism slips in there. When Jeremiah says, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? You've planted them, and they've taken root. They grow and bear fruit. You, God, are always on their lips, but far from their hearts. When Jeremiah says that, it sounds a lot like a criticism of people 
who feel happy and good about themselves, whose goal in life is to be far from God, but to be happy and good. People who've prospered, who live at ease, who are planted and take root, who grow and bear fruit. They prosper, they're happy. And God, yeah, I'll, I'll talk a lot about God. God's on my lips. He's far from my heart. And I don't want him in my life. I don't want him telling me that I need to change. And, and I think a certain part of us, that's kind of attractive to our human nature, isn't it? Wouldn't it be nice? You know, hey, just, there's a nice God, and as long as I'm nice, I get to go to heaven, and it's about me, and, and I get to make all my choices, and, and God's just going to nod his head because he's an old, retired guy, and he's just going to, he just wants me to be happy. If that's your choice, I, I'm not going to judge you. It, it is your life. And we each choose who we're going to follow and who we're going to serve. For me, though, I want to serve God. I want to serve the real God. A God who, whose ways are higher and greater than my ways. Who's, a God who is not looking to make me happy, but a God who is good, who calls me to great things, to higher things. A God who, who's going to test me, who's going to put me in situations to refine me, to purify me, to make me more in his image, to give my life richness, purpose, beyond just simply being okay for me, but something that is much greater than me something that is put in place by a living and real God, and that he loves me so much that he's willing to include me in his, in his work. But it's not about me, it's about him. And this God, my standards are pretty low. My standard is as long as I look good on the outside, as long as I, I can compare myself to my neighbors I'm, I'm good, as long as I'm a smidge above, you know, the horrible person I can point to. I, I, I must be all right. But I want to follow a God who calls me to more than that. A God who calls me to things that I can't reach, but that only He can help me to reach. And, and this God, the God of the Bible... He tells me that nothing I do is going to be good enough because I'm, I've turned from him. I live in a broken world full of sin, and even my best efforts are, are contaminated and infused with the sin that's all around me. And yet, a God who is so loving and kind that he's willing to step in and pay the price for what I've done. And through his son, if I just simply accept his son, that he's going to see me as good. That my uncleanness is going to be covered by his pure robes. This God doesn't say that my life is going to be easy and carefree. He actually says the opposite. He says that everyone who desires to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted, but that there is happiness, joy, peace that surpasses understanding. That's not about emotions, but which is about him and who he is. You know, I think the biggest problem with Mother D and Mother D thinking, it's really, it has no place for Jesus. There, there is, if all God wants is 
for us to be good and kind, and then we all go to heaven, along with all dogs, then there was no need for Jesus to come. There was no need for Jesus to suffer. There was no need for Jesus to die. There was no need for Jesus to be firstborn among those who were raised because we all could have done it by ourselves. And this brings me to, to the final point. And I know I've touched on this already a little bit. That final point is none of us are good. You know, Jesus in, in the Gospel of Mark, in Mark 10, 18 says, in answer to someone calling him good, Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one. No one is good except God alone. And we sometimes tend to, I think we like to have humans that we elevate to demigod status. <clears throat> In Jeremiah here, after Jeremiah talks about well, here, I'll just read from the beginning. Jeremiah 12, 1. You are always righteous, Lord, when I bring a case before you, yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? You have, taint, you have planted them, and they have taken root. They grow and bear fruit. You are always on their lips, but far from their hearts. Yet you know me, Lord. You see me and test my thoughts about you. Drag them off like sheep to be butchered. Set them apart for the day of slaughter. We sometimes think that everyone in the Bible, all the people that it talks about, are, you know, like demigods. They're perfect. Jeremiah is a prophet. He must be perfect. Anything Jeremiah says must have been great. I don't think I don't think Jeremiah crying out that the people he was concerned about should be dragged off like sheep to be butchered, be cut apart, be killed. I don't think Jeremiah is being good or perfect in God's eyes. When he says, set them apart for the day of slaughter. God, don't, don't try to reach out to these people. God, you, you, just, you just separate them. You let them die. I, I think we all know David. You know, David, a man whose, whose heart, he was a man after God's own heart. And yet David was not a man after God's own heart when he commits adultery with Bathsheba. And he's definitely not a man after God's own heart when he conspires to kill her husband. He is. He does show his heart, though, when Nathan comes to him and confronts him with what he did. And, and he softens and he doesn't try to argue how he was right and how it was all justified, but he just falls and says, I have sinned against the Lord. <coughs> Abraham. Abraham believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. But not everything Abraham did was righteous. It was not because he was righteous. It was because he believed and trusted in a righteous God that he was counted as righteous. When Abraham went into Egypt and he lied about his wife and said it was actually his sister, this is not God telling us that it's okay to lie. This is Abraham demonstrating that he is just a man, that he is sinful, that even though God blesses him and promises 
that we will be his offspring. That even though he is past childbearing age and his wife is way past any human ability to give birth, that God will give him more offspring than the stars in the sky. We like to create saints and demigods in, in the kind of perfect people kind of way. God calls us all to be saints in the imperfect human way, that we should set ourselves apart to serve him and to obey him and to follow his ways, but acknowledging that we're not perfect, that we're not good, we're not better than other people. We have just been loved by a good God. In Malachi 2.17, God says to, to Malachi, he says, You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or where is the God of justice? And in answer, in Malachi 3, 1, God says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. We're not perfect. But God, because he loves us, because he is good, because he is just, sent someone to pay for our price, Jesus so that we might be with him, that we might be his children. So I, at the start, um, I showed some pictures of, of people who, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know their lives. I can't tell you whether they are wicked. I can only see their outside. And so I say nothing about whether they are wicked or good, but I've offered them just as examples of people who tend to reflect <clears throat> what, what Jeremiah is talking about here. People who, who look like they're prospering. People who look like they're at ease. People who look happy. They've got, they've got Mother D on their side. And I don't, I'm not judging them, but I would just like to offer to you that often when we see people, and Facebook is horrible for this, you know, everyone posts their, their best holiday experience pictures, and, and we look, and, you know, sometimes people look and go, wow, my, my life isn't that good. Well, neither is theirs. They just had one good photo from, you know, a holiday. But we can often feel like everyone else has it good, and we're the only let's take a look at these people here. They look prosperous. They look at ease. They look happy. But I think it was only on the outside. So the first one, that's Chester Bennington in the middle. He's lead vocalist, lead singer for, for Lincoln Park. He was, he was called one of the greatest rock vocalists of all time and had an estimated net worth of $30 million. I say had, because Chester Bennington, at the age of 41, he hung himself. Millions of fans, adored by his industry, accolades, money, women, prosperous. He had all the things that we normally think are what we need. We think that he had it. Chester hung himself at the age of 41. Finn Casperson Sr., billionaire, financier, and philanthropist. And it's a little bit hard to say whether it was, you know, a billion just under, but we're talking like more money than I can ever imagine. He was a graduate of Brown University and Harvard Law. He attended church. 
he, he was prosperous. His life was at ease. I don't know what his relationship was with God, but there was something wrong. There was something missing. Because even though he went to church, one day he decided that all he had wasn't good enough. That it wasn't satisfying. So he took a blued steel, 38 caliber, Smith & Wesson handgun, and he shot himself in the head. Loren Scott, you probably recognize the man with Loren there, Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones. If you don't know who Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones are, talk to your mom or your dad. Loren Scott was Mick Jagger's longtime girlfriend. And she was wealthy and influential and powerful all on her own. She was a model and fashion designer. And yet it wasn't good enough for her. She hung herself in 2014. Jarrett Peterson, nicknamed Speedy, Olympic silver medalist. Man, that Olympic silver medalist. Nine times he medaled on the World Cup circuit in, in aerials. You know, wow. He shot himself in the head at the age of 29. When I, was, when I was younger, before I knew Christ, I tried to commit suicide several times. It obviously didn't work. Um, because it wasn't working. Because all the things that were supposed to bring me happiness weren't enough. And yet, I would say to you now that if you're really looking for it, and it that works, personally, culturally, corporately, the only it that can bring that peace to fill that hole is, is not attached to a pipe, it's not inside a bottle, it's not a woman or a man, it's not money, but it is Jesus Christ. It's a relationship. It's a relationship with the King of Kings. It's a relationship with a personal, living God who loves you. Not some impersonal Mother D, but a real and living God who desires to be part of your life. That it is relationship to Jesus Christ and life, rich, bountiful life in his name. If you, if you have it, then may you bear much fruit. May you continue to follow Jesus Christ and to love him more and more. May he abound in you. And if, if you haven't made that relationship yet, this God is a God of justice and a God of love. And he's, he's ready to meet you and to give, to give you life. And he is good. So if you'd like to find out more, explore, no pressure. Like any relationship, you know, you, you have to take it at, at your pace and the pace of the person you're, you're building a relationship with. But if you'd like to explore a bit more about this person, Jesus Christ, you know, contact, contact Bendale and myself, 
one of the elders, one of, one of any of the people here, I think, would love to tell you about it, our relationship to Jesus Christ. So why don't I pray? And then we'll wrap it up with, with a final song. Heavenly Father, God, I pray for George Floyd in, in Minneapolis. I pray for all the people that are struggling because of what happened. I pray for those that love him and, and that those for those that know him and knew him. But I pray also for the police officers involved, Lord, that you be good to them as well. Not because they are good, but because you are good. That you love us not because we are perfect, but because you are. God, I pray for each and every one of us that we would love and know you more. To know you more in fullness. And to follow you because you are good. Because you are it. Because there is no other way to the Father than through the Son. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.